like being getting older now and hearing like it was VHS camera and then it was like you know my my iPhone or my uh, my old like uh, was iPod video you know yep. and you just mm -hmm. see how like the generations are just using the new tools to like make their like first short films and I feel like uh, as an adult now everything I do is constantly going back to that feeling of play that I had like as a kid. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the About Story Podcast. I am here today with Ben. Welcome, Ben, to the show. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here, man. Absolutely, yeah. You've been working for a little bit here, and you're doing a lot of cool stuff, so I'm really excited to get into it. I am. I'm getting to be old, and so <laughs> I'll share all my old stories, and hopefully it'll give you, all, all of you young pups, some wisdom in the industry. We'll see. Yeah. Or maybe not. Maybe I'll mm -hmm. be like, this guy's crazy. So we'll <laughs> a little, see. Or a little bit of both. A little bit of both. A little bit of both. Yeah, sounds right. good. Dude, awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So tell me a little bit, like, where you grew up. Did yeah. you grow up in, in LA? Like, where are you no, from? No, no. So I'm originally from the Midwest. So I'm from Indiana. So a little suburb outside of Indianapolis. And I feel like my story is like a lot of people's stories. It's like my brother and I stole my dad's VHS camera and just started making short films. One of them, it's funny because we're reviving it for a, a feature film that we're actually wrapping up this year. We found this old lambskin jacket my dad had and Austin Powers was big at the time. So I put on this lambskin jacket and like rolled around in my underwear as the secret agent. And it became this like series of short films we made called Secret Mailman. So he was a secret mailman, and nice. uh, and that was the, the greatest thing in the world. But dude, I feel like I, I don't know, I don't know your story, but I feel like a, a lot of people's experiences is like as kids, you just like found a camera and started playing, whether it was like stop motion, and it's just it's funny like like being getting older now and hearing like. It was VHS camera, and then it was like you know my my iPhone or my uh, my old like uh, was iPod video, you know, yep. and you just mm -hmm. see how like the generations are just using the new tools to like make their like first short films, and I feel like uh, as an adult now, everything I do is constantly going back to that feeling of play that I had like as a kid is I feel like the industry can be very business, you know, and trying to manufacture everything. And constantly when I'm doing my own projects is how do we get back to that same play of me rolling around in my underwear as a British secret agent? You know what I mean? It's like, how do we bring that same kind of energy and just fun to, to the projects we're making? So yeah, so that, that's yeah. how I started, came out to LA, did film school, uh, went to Biola University. I feel like they did a really great job of just teaching uh, the craft, the tools, uh, how to use cameras, how to use lighting. I think we mentioned earlier that it's like we got our hands on gear like day one. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, we're you're learning to use these tools. I remember the big thing was the Red One camera had mm -hmm. just like it had been out for a little bit, but they had like just gotten a Red One and we're like, what? We can one, like yeah. shoot 4K and it's amazing. And then I remember. And we, it was we, huge. It, it was, was huge. Like, it was, it was like, like this big. <laughs> and he had to like take a course to like learn how to use it. And all this, I never took the course. I was terrified. But we were still shooting on like DV cameras. And then around my senior year, there were these crazy kids that said, I'm going to buy a photo camera, a photo still camera, and I'm going to shoot video with it. And it's going to look awesome. And I remember all of us being like, these stupid kids, like, come on, using a photo camera. And then you saw their short films, like, this is glorious. And so I uh, picked up the SLR trend uh, mm -hmm. then. And, uh, and after film school, I went to, to Lionsgate. I actually worked at Lionsgate Entertainment in their horror uh, department, funny enough. And so I have some crazy stories I'd love to share from that experience. But uh, just kind of seeing behind the scenes, I feel like that was really like kind of Biola was this beautiful like creative or making stuff. The idea of art, you know, mm. was kind of something that thrived. And then you get into the business side. It's like, you know, it's literally like the, the TV show The Office but in the entertainment industry is, you know, white walls, very sterile, like office, but you're learning behind the scenes how films get made, why certain films get made, and there's very little emotion in it. There's very little, I don't Heart. wanna say, yeah, 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 or, or even I would say creativity. Not, not, I don't mean that people aren't creative. I'm not saying it doesn't go into it, but that's not a factor. It's, mm -hmm. hey, what are our elements we need in this package to make and sell something? It's very much that like business mindset, and I feel very blessed that, I kind of got to see that experience early on because um, it just, I think, helped with some of the rejection and things that you go through later on pitching projects is you realize it, it's not that anyone's trying to be mean to you. It's not that your project sucks. It's that it's not the right fit for what this company needs or their formula they're putting out for the next couple of years. And so I think that really just helps kind of create some resilience uh, in yourself and just trying to understand that business side a little bit more. That's not personal, 
uh, it's simply business and their formula that they need. So uh, working in Lionsgate, that was a great experience. And then after that, my wife and I started our own production company. Uh, it's called Ironside Films. And we, we actually got into the beauty business. And so we do a lot of like with like L'Oreal and a lot of these companies. That's kind of what pays the bills. We've kind of grown in that space where we worked with one client. This is, you know, big beauty client L'Oreal. And then people would leave and go to other beauty companies. And so now we're working with Gwen Stefani's company. We're working with Lady Gaga's company. And it's been one of these things I never would have thought like, I'd be the makeup guy, but it's just this thing that I know how to shoot it really well now. I know how to like direct it really well now and get get the kind of results that they need. And so that basically uh, pays the bills and funds us to make our own independent films on the side. And so we kind of have this rule that every year we make an indie feature. That's kind of our thing. And it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be huge. It can be shot on an iPhone. It can be something running around. But just having that... Um, kind of kind of uh, motivation to just keep creating and keep making as opposed to getting stuck into oh now I'm the beauty guy and that's all I do um, and so that's been something that's been really we now have five feature films that we have wow. uh, racked up that's incredible and, and it's great but they need to get out now that's kind of where <laughs> is my wife was like it was, she's like, we're not making another movie until, because she's my producing and writing partner. She's like, we're not making another movie until we start getting these out. And so now we have this motivation to start getting the films actually wrapped up and out the door. Because it's one of those things you like get a thing in the can, you start editing it, and you're like, what's the next one? And then you like move on, and you like didn't quite finish that one. Mm. So now it's like, we got to get these done and get them out. So that's, I feel like everyone kind of has a lot of that journey if you're wanting to be a writer director or something in that lane where you're actually like creating content is what's your day job you use to pay the bills right. to kind of fund the thing that you actually want to do. Yeah. So I hope that that fills in a, a little bit of, of who I am and where I came from. Yeah, so, that's yeah. amazing. I think it's really great to see uh, how, you, how you've moved through life and you've kind of like, you, everybody's on their own journey. Everybody's yeah. like doing their own thing. Uh, and I also think it's really cool that you're actually working with your wife yeah, uh, yeah. on your on your projects. Can you tell me a little bit how you guys met and then how you guys started working together? Well, crazy stories. We actually met in junior high. Mm. So we were like friends in junior high and then we started dating in high school. And then um, she went to a school in the Midwest and I went out to Biola. And then as we got more serious, she came out to Biola and kind of helped on the film side, helped on, on film projects. She studied psychology. So very much when we write scripts together and work on things, she's always trying to look for that extra layer. I love especially having like uh, a female voice going into these things is I feel like sometimes you're just like trying to spit out pages or get things done. And and I think she kind of comes in and is like, what are these layers though? Why are we doing this? How does this benefit the story? How what does this reveal about the character? Um, and it's just been very interesting as we've kind of figured out that relationship uh, of working together in that way. And, uh, and I love that. I, I feel like when you're picking collaborators, it can be a little difficult because everyone has their own point of view. I think everyone can have their own motivation and sometimes that can be unhealthy in the creative process where it's like, okay, I have this writing buddy I love, but they're wanting to do it in this direction. I'm wanting it to do it in this direction. Sometimes that can be good friction and sometimes, especially when we're doing indie stuff, it can just rip a project apart For sure. because yeah. you're meeting up once a month or whenever you have free time and then you're not on the same page and it, it can make the project kind of flounder. And so what I love is that with her, we can be brushing our teeth going to bed at night talking through, what'd you think about that scene and blah, blah, blah. Well, I didn't think that character were, and we t were able to like talk through it and we have the same kind of, I, I don't know, goal in what we're trying to do with our films as opposed to, like I've worked with producers before even where it's like, you know, well, what are we doing different this way? How are we leveling up? And it's like, well, I, I don't have time to level up because I just need to be making. And so, mm -hmm. and, and not that that's a bad thing and not that that can't be good for some people, but we have, you know, sometimes that can flounder things. You're putting so much pressure on a project as opposed to like just getting it done. And what I love about her is, uh, I'll be like, hey, I, you know, if I had two more days to do these pickups or two more days, and she's like, I'll give you one day. And then you edit it together and you get it out the door. And she's like, do better on the next one. That's always her thing is like, mm -hmm. we need to get it out. Don't sit here and make it this precious thing that you're constantly tweaking for the rest of your life. Like at some point it has to just get out the door. And so I love that about her is that she's very supportive in the creative aspect, but she's also like, we got to get it done, bro. We got to get this out the door. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. It's it's great to have a partner like that. If you have a partner that's actually working in the industry yeah. and then you can connect with them and they understand like what you're going through, I think that makes a lot of difference. Right. And helps right. with your like personal relationship and your business relationship right. as well. I always I always uh just last night um we watched this clip from the movie Hook 
where mm. Dustin Hoffman has this gun. I don't know if you see it. And he's like, I'm going to shoot myself, Smee, Smee, I'm going to shoot myself. And he's like, save me, Smee, save me, take the gun. And he, like, pulls the gun away from him as he's about to shoot himself. And I'm like, this is our relationship. Is I'm mm. always the, like, dramatic, like, are we doing it the right way? Is it the right? And she's Smee having to come be like, take the gun away from your pr- proverbial gun, not a real <laughs> gun. <laughs> away from my head being like, no, we need to keep moving forward, keep doing it. Don't get bogged down by these things. Mm. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So tell me a little bit about Lionsgate. I mean, you, is that yeah. your first job working on the industry? So that was my first job working on the industry. I was there for six years. Um, and primarily we worked in the horror uh, department and I did a lot of video. We had a, a streaming channel called Fearnet, and then we worked with a lot of the uh, the other films that they had. So I got to interview like Francis Ford Coppola. Oh, wow. Did uh, a movie called Twixt, I want to say, with Val Kilmer. And so we got to interview him. I got to, we got to interview Ridley Scott because he did Prometheus. So anything that like touched on horror and sci-fi, we did a lot of like EPK stuff, like the behind the scenes interview stuff. So really got to kind of like just sit back and I, I would DP a lot of these shoots and do some of the interviews and just uh, listen to how other filmmakers created. And so we would do Mm -hmm. stuff at that like higher level of these like kind of horror veteran icons, uh, you know, doing these things or, you know, just veteran directors doing these kind of horror projects. But then we'd also interview the smaller like indie horror guys and see kind of their growth over the years of like they started out as something little that did pretty decently. They made sequels to it and so on and so forth. And so I think that was a really cool way to like get on sets and really experience how different sets ran, what were the practical things. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. I feel like we can talk so much. Or as a theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or Mm -hmm. even as a student film, you're thinking in this very small window, but then to be on like a real feature film set and see, oh, this indie guy is scrappy, so he's doing it with this thing in this way. This Ridley Scott type guy is doing it in this way and this way, you know? And so it was kind of a great education. But I feel like one story I wanted to share is, so my boss at this horror site, he's the guy that found the Saw franchise. So he found the original James Wan film and, and brought it to Lionsgate. And so they kind of copied and pasted those. They still are. I think they're still making sequels. But I kind of learned that, like, when I was at Lionsgate, it was this thing, you'd find a, you'd find a thing that worked, and you copy and paste that formula over and over again. And so for us, for uh, we were kind of on the tail end of the Saw franchise when I was there. But then they found Twilight. So Twilight was happening while I was there. And you saw them copy and paste that. And then they picked up Hunger Games. And they copy and pasted that. And then they did the Divergent series. And they copy and pasted that. And so it was really good just kind of seeing on the inside that it's like, we find things that work this formula. And we just copy and paste it. And so creatively, it's like you can fit within that sandbox, right? But if you're trying to be something outside that sandbox, you're probably going to get a no. Like we pitched multiple mm-hmm. projects and did all the, you know, the teaser trailers and pitch packets, spent mm-hmm. thousands of dollars, but didn't fit into that puzzle piece, right, that they need for what they're doing and what they've, you know, greenlit. And so what's crazy is, is my boss at Lionsgate, he shared this story with me, and I'll never forget. I'm very thankful that he was very open. He's like 30, 40-year-old veteran of the industry that's kind of like he'd seen it all. And he's like... So, you know, I was doing this movie, working on this movie with his friend, and uh, and he brought me this script. And I told him, like, hey, like, you have two things that don't work in this script, right? There's ballet, and then there's horror, this, like, horror aspect. And he's like, horror people don't like ballet, and ballet people don't like horror. He's like, you should not make this movie. And that movie was Black Swan by Darren Aronofsky. And he told me, he, like, looked me in the eyes, he's like, thank God that Darren didn't listen to me. Because that movie, I think it was nominated for multiple Oscars. I'm not sure if it won, but it was nominated for something. And just to hear that from this veteran guy who had worked through the formulas over and over again and had made made a living as a big Hollywood producer, basically say, I'm not saying this to be mean in the nicest way, like, we don't know what we're doing. Like, we don't know what's going to hit and what's not going to hit. And we can structure that formula, right, for certain films. And, no, this will probably give us a return on this or give us a return. But those things on that are outside that don't fit that they don't know what's going to connect with an audience and what doesn't. And if they did, then every movie would be a hit, right? Right. Every movie would make a bazillion dollars, but they don't. And so, I don't know, that was one of those things that I'll never forget that it just gave me the freedom in my head to be like, I don't need anyone else's approval to like make the things that I feel called to make because they they, they may not see the vision and it's not their job to see the vision in all reality. Mm-hmm. Like if I can f- force them to or coax them into it, that'd be great. But it's my responsibility if I feel that calling to tell that story that doesn't fit into the box to create that myself or get that out myself because they, they're, they're trying to keep the business alive. That's their job. And I don't want to necessarily fit into that fully all the time, if that makes sense. Totally. So. 
Totally. Anyway, so what are some of the projects that you're working on? So you're working on some of your, you tell me you wrote like five features. Yes. Yeah. What was that process like for you? We just started making them, man. I feel like is, is the biggest thing is like, um, we did a slasher film right after I, uh, kind of was wrapping at a lion's gate. Um, so that would be my first feature film. It's called Made Me Do It. And it's one of these things that like I saw how much our horror side was buying uh, movies for. And so I'm like, dude, if we like make a slasher film and keep it under this budget and then they buy it, like we'll make a little bit of money back. It'll be great. And so we shoot this slasher film with some Biola buddies from film school. We get, oh my gosh, if I can just share a story. <laughs> so my buddy, my cinematographer friend is amazing. He's incredible. But we were originally planning on shooting on like a like a 5D and doing this like run and gun small horror movie, and he worked at Panavision. Was like, dude, I can cut us a deal and we'll get these big Panavision cameras. It's gonna look amazing. And so we're like, sure. And so it went from like a five person crew, to like a thirty person crew, and just got it got it got in my it got too big. It just got too mm-hmm. big. And so we tried to fit the slasher formula. You know, um, I'm very proud of of a good chunk of the movie. But uh, slasher films aren't even necessarily like my cup of tea, but it's like we could do it cheap and sell it. And so that was one where we kind of tried to fit a little bit of the formula so that we could, you know, actually make some money on it. So we shoot this film, we shoot these big cameras, it looks great, and then we go to sell it, and the Lionsgate shuts down the horror department that I was a part of. Oh, and so now man. we have this movie, and I'm just <laughs> like, why? And again, I'm very proud. I don't mean to like talk bad about it, but we, we, we tried to fit it in the formula, mm-hmm. right? It wasn't something that I was necessarily like fully like, oh, I love slasher movies. Let's make a slasher movie. And so I learned a lesson from that. We eventually sold it to a distributor and got it out the door and all that stuff. In, unless I'm getting paid to fit in the sandbox, I'm not necessarily going to try to make stuff that fits into that. I want to make stuff that I'm inspired by and I'm motivated by. And so actually this new film, we have a new film uh, releasing on Thursday. So on Amazon Prime, it's called Return to Me. It's a fully improvised feature film. I DP'd it myself. It was like, it was that five person crew running around creating a story. And I think for me, that's where it's like, you know, not to bash, uh, like that cinematographer that I worked with is great for bigger projects. He's amazing and and beautiful shots, everything great with the gear. But when I'm running around needing to make something scrappy that doesn't like fit into my box, my sandbox that I need to play in. That's kind of the formula we've been following lately is like, Small crew, I usually DP myself because I work as a DP in the industry, DP and direct, and that way I can be right there with the actors instead of there being this, like, I'm in Video Village, you know, across the garage, you know, it's Yelling like... over a bullhorn. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and I think for me, the biggest thing that I feel like I learned from our first movie is performance is everything in the indie mm. space, is it's like, you can have a movie that's shot like crap, but if performances are incredible, it doesn't matter. But you can have a movie that's shot beautifully, and if you're rushing so fast that performances are rushed and you can't dig into it, you're going to notice that right off the bat. And so I can't tell you, like, I've had friends make movies before, you know, other feature films, and I'll go to their screenings. And beautifully shot, amazing. And then you can tell, I always say in the first 10 minutes, you can tell. And you're just like, this is going to be awesome. And then the actor starts talking. And you're like, oh, okay, this is now in this category. And mm-hmm. that's not meant to be mean. They were doing their best that they could. If you, if you've My thing is... Any person who's made a feature film, it's a miracle. Like, it's a miracle that you've made a movie. And now the next step is, how do you make a good one? And that's that's even more of a miracle. And I don't know. We'll see. We'll release our movies and see if we made good ones. I don't know. But uh, but that, for me, the performance is is number one. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you were saying you were working on this, this latest feature. Yeah. What was the writing process? So we just did an outline. We did, like, a, a 10-page outline and then gave it to our actors. And the whole thing was I had... An actor that I'd uh, gone to Second City Improv class with, that she was amazingly talented. Another actress I'd worked with on a church video, funny enough. Hmm. And she was able to, I talk about how her name's Every. Um, she's covered in tattoos, has pink hair, but we did the scene where it was like morning. It was like this uh, Good Friday video, right? And so the thing I told everyone is like, your best friend has died, and I want to see that emotion. And dude, she broke down, was crying. Hmm. And then a big thing for me is when actors can get in and get out. And so you're not just not having to live in that space all day. And she was able to like get in and get out really quickly. And so uh, my wife was a producer on that project and we came back and we're like, we need to make a movie around this girl. Like she's amazing. And so we wrote this outline for Return to Me um, that's about, uh, it's dealing with pregnancy and pregnancy loss and some of those things. My wife had worked in adoption for a season. And so she had very much heard these stories of like, 
they sound cliche, but the 16 year old girl who gets pregnant in Idaho and her parents are kicking her out and she needs to place her baby for adoption. And then you have this family, this very wealthy, affluent family that aren't able to have kids. And they kind of bring these family, you know, bring these two together. And it's this beautiful kind of new family they're able to create. And so we kind of wanted to take some of those experiences that she had had and gone, like my wife had experienced and gone through uh, and put it into a script and kind of discuss some of that. We were, we had just become parents ourselves. We'd had our son. And so there was a little bit of guilt, honestly, in our end of like, why did our pregnancy go smoothly? And why did we never have any issues? But my wife is every day hearing these stories of women going through these trials. Mm -hmm. um, and so this movie was kind of a way for us to process some of that uh, and just work with friends that we wanted to work with. And so it was beautiful as we kind of brought this story and just allowed uh, the actors to just fill the space. You know, we, I, I'd be with them and be like, hey, here's where we start. Here's kind of a middle thing I'd suggest. And here's how I kind of want to wrap it up. But you fill, like, you fill it in. And they were just able to find such honesty and truth in what they were doing. It was hard to look away sometimes. And, mm -hmm. and honestly, it was hard to replicate. As we were getting coverage, sometimes it's like, we have this one kitchen fight scene that opens the film between a husband and wife. And we got one angle on it because like by the end of it, we were just exhausted. Like she put everything into this performance mm -hmm. and we're just like, that's our take. Like that's our one. And just being very open handed with the process instead of being rigid of this is exactly how it has to be. But then taking that to now the, the new films that I've made since then, it's like we have scripts for those films, but bring that same improvisational aspect to it. It's like do a read that's the script and now let's do a read that's none of the words on the script. And then when you're editing, you have those options that you can kind of blend together. Or a lot of times the actors will fill in a gap that you didn't even think was there and add so much depth to it that you you wouldn't have seen. So, yeah. Anyways, I hope that answers. No, that's great. Some of it. Yeah. I mean, I for me, I always tell people like work it's, it really depends on who you're working with. Mm -hmm. So, if you can find amazing actors, you find an amazing crew, mm -hmm. it's going to make the whole entire process so much yeah. better and just more enjoyable. It's yeah. like I like working with my friends. I like working with people that I enjoy being around. Dude, Lauren Michaels from Saturday Night Live where he's talking about casting uh, actors or crew and he's like you want to have someone that you want to see at 3 a.m. when you're exhausted walking through the office you know mm -hmm. what I mean like that's who you want to work with and I think even with actors like I, I've grown to really love that relationship where I see them I, I think coming out of film school no one really t taught us how to work with actors or I didn't feel like it and so there's no. kind of this like the actors over there in the makeup area like let's not talk to them let's give them space and you're like terrified of them you know a little bit and I feel like growing and working more with actors, it's how do I become a support for them? How do I create an environment and a culture where they feel like they can experiment and there's no wrong answer that they can play and there's no fear of, you're doing it wrong, get out of here, you know, cut, get them out of here. And so that's something that I've really tried to bring to all my projects is how do we work as a team and create that environment where they feel safe to explore and play, get back to play, you know, like as a yeah. kid, mm -hmm. playing and having fun. And I remember for Return to Me, we even did this little prayer every day where we just asked like, the creative gods or however you want to put it to just come and mess up everything that we have planned and to like bring us truth and honesty and what we're doing as opposed to what's written on the page may not be the right answer for what should be in the film. Yeah. And so true. just being willing to like be open about that and throw things out the window that don't work. Where do you feel like you get your ideas for, for your stories? Do you have, are they more like personal oh or like comes from different places? Yeah. I feel like for me, it's become this thing that's, um, I now know that a feature takes about two years to make. Like mm -hmm. it's two years of your life that you're mm -hmm. going to be committed on like concept to shooting to editing. You know, it's like a year to get the concept together and things together, a year to shoot it roughly, you know, like get everything you need if you're doing pickups and all that stuff. And then a year to edit it together, get sound mix score and everything. And so really kind of figuring out what, uh, what story it's say, what story do you want to be with at 3 AM when you're yeah. exhausted and tired and you'll have that extra energy to take it through when you don't want to open that premiere project file again and make that tweak. You know what I'm saying? Cause it happens on every project. And so uh, that's kind of been my thing is like, I want to tell the stories I feel called to tell that like, if I, I always talk about like, if I was hit by a bus tomorrow, what's the legacy I want to leave as a filmmaker and an artist that you could say, oh, mm -hmm. this is what he wanted to explore or things he wanted to share and making sure the projects I take on express that in some way, or I'm allowed to put that within a project. You know, mm -hmm. like I had a friend, one of our more recent films is called Burn My Money. It's a boxing movie. And that happened, we shot during COVID, during the lockdown. And basically how that happened is my buddy, he was an actor, had worked in two of my other projects. I saw him on Instagram post uh, that he was part of the stunt gym in LA where they teach actors how to do falls, how to get thrown into things and all that stuff, boxing, fighting, you know, tactical stuff. 
uh, and I just Instagram messaged him. And I was like, hey, dude, when are we making our boxing movie? And so we just started talking and collaborating and developing these, this idea of characters and where we wanted to go. And then the COVID pandemic hit and LA was locked down. We didn't even know what like it was at the time. Like this is how this is how early it was. It was like we were shut down for maybe like three days or something like that. And I literally messaged him and was like, dude, like we're shut down. I've got nothing to do. Work's dried up. What do you want to do? And he's like, so I'm in my house. He's like, I'm in this house that I'm living in. And I only have it for like another two weeks. He's like, do you want to shoot everything in this house? And so basically I took our outline and I'm like, okay, we need this scene and this scene and this scene and this scene in the house. And I just wrote those pages. We didn't even have a script, just had the outline. I just wrote those pages and then I'd show up to his house and we'd film out those pages. And then he'd be like, hey, we got this location with these guys that are available. You know, and then I would write those pages. It was literally like, I'd be writing pages a day before we'd film or like sometimes the night before we'd go to film. And it was kind of like he had these actor buddies and people that were itching to do something because they'd mm -hmm. been shut locked down. Mm -hmm. So we were able to get some like stunt guys in for these boxing matches that we did. You know, one of our guys had access to a warehouse, so we got it for free. We just showed up. He brought, you know, my buddy brought some beers. I brought some food and we just like shot out scenes. And it was kind of like just looking through the outline of basic like, okay, we know he needs to train, okay? So we need to have three training scenes. Yeah. This time he doesn't get along with the trainer. This time we're starting to get along more. This time he has like a panic attack and is struggling again because you know. And we just like wrote the scenes and then went and filmed them, because we'd have then we had like a boxing training cool location in some guy's backyard, and uh, and we just filmed out all the scenes that we had there. And so just kind of like building it as we it was like building the plane as we're flying it here basically and then what was cool is i could then take that back and kind of assemble it in the edit and be like what are we missing what's something mm -hmm. we need to add in mm -hmm. kind of built that story that way and that's one of those where he kind of brought more the concept to me but then i was able to fill it with with kind of my voice and what i wanted to express through it and so you know a big thing as we talked about it's like creed is out and creed's amazing yeah you know rocky has been done a hundred billion times right. so how do we do something that's a little bit different and maybe uh, subverts expectations a little bit and I, I kind of pitch it more as like it's a drama with boxing instead of mm. it being a boxing movie mm -hmm. and so that's been a really fun experience as we're kind of we got final score on that one a couple weeks ago and so I'm really excited to see that one kind of come out so but dude, it's crazy to like reflect then on Sorry, get me all excited here. Like, because we didn't know what the pandemic was at the time. Like I said, we mm -hmm. shot this early on. And then as they started bringing in these like t uh, 10 o'clock curfews and all this stuff that were happening, we started integrating that into the story of like isolation, being stuck in this space. You know, these guys are basically like on the run for something, but they're stuck. You know, they can't get away from, you know, what they're trying to get away from. And so you know, it ended up being like, you know, basically after the pandemic ended, we, we filmed fake news, uh, you know, inserts to put in to try to can build this thing that I feel like we were all feeling at the time a little bit, uh, being locked into our homes and a little, little stir crazy. So it's just funny. I feel like that one, we, uh, I like, I remember literally like there's a line in it about COVID that my wife literally, as I was going to film, she's like, just grab a line about COVID. We don't know if this is going to be a big thing or not, but it might be a good like motivation for the movie. And so when we were filming with one of the actors, I had him be like, yeah, they're doing these like boxing webcasts because of COVID. It's like, I have one take of it. And it ended up being like, oh, this is two years of our lives, you know? So uh -huh. yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, crazy how times change and like you have to just roll with the punches. Yeah, 100%. And I think what's beautiful is that it can even create new shades or, or new viewpoints on the things that you mm. made. Like I, a big influence for us was Taxi Driver on that one, you know, and how I feel like Taxi Driver is just this kind of terrible character that you're following the whole time. Like, you know, and, and you get into it and why, but I feel like we don't, maybe Joker is like one of the more mm -hmm. recent that we've seen do that. But I feel like lately your characters cannot be as flawed anymore. They cannot be broken as much. Your leads, they mm -hmm. kind of like already need to be perfect in certain ways. And so we very much wanted to go in making very flawed characters that you wanted to see growth from. You wanted to see them kind of have these revelations and struggle with things in their past, as opposed to it just being like another like, you know, Rocky's very honorable. He's a good guy in a bad area. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to kind of do the opposite where it's like, this guy kind of sucks and does terrible, <laughs> has done some terrible things. And how do we try to not necessarily fully redeem him, but give him some redemption and growth, growth through this? Mm. So I know for me, I like characters who are able to overcome mm. things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that resonates with people is a character who's able to, you know, overcome circumstances and to change and to grow and to become yeah. a better person. Yeah. Uh, because we can all relate to that. We're all like trying to get better. We're all trying to grow. 
And I think that's what kind of what inspires people. Like, it's like Creed or Rocky. It's like that the the underdog story we would do. Like, and I always start the first Rocky and I'm watching all of them. Mm-hmm. I get to like Creed mm-hmm. too. I just like go through because it's like no matter how many times it's the same thing. It's the same, same movie. Yeah. It's the same movie, but I you just are sucked into it. It's beautiful to see him overcoming these things and even make bad decisions and have mm-hmm. to like you know overcome that. So I feel like it, today we've kind of lost that in some of our filmmaking. Is like I said, it's like. You know, you have the, like, Mary Sue-type character. I'm not going to express what films I feel like do that. <laughs> but it's like you go back and watch some of these older films of people struggling. And I'd say Mary Sue can also be for men, too. I'm just saying yeah. that we have yeah. those. Uh, but it's like, you know, you want to put your characters through hell a bit and yeah. see how they grow and how they persevere through that because we go through that every day. And we're not always just from page one set up to, to deal with the things that come our way. So, yeah. yeah. What's, yeah. Your, what's your day-to-day look like? Yeah, so for the bulk of it, it's doing makeup videos, it's working in the beauty space, and so, you know, we've kind of, uh, I talk about how you have a day job that kind of funds the the what you want to do job, and so for us, I'm very thankful that we kind of landed in this beauty biz, you know, we've made some really strong relationships, but what's been really cool is they'll rent our gear, because I'm a mm. cinematographer, director, it's like they'll rent our equipment, and so we bought our first RED camera to do, and this is the guy who didn't take the RED training up, by the way, <laughs> we bought our first RED camera to shoot our horror slasher movie, like years and years and years ago, and so we used that to kind of get work in the beauty biz, and then they started, you know, renting more of our equipment and all this stuff, and so we would just buy more gear and buy more gear, and then at some point, we even got requested, because our RED camera got so old, they're like, you need to get the new RED camera, because we can't rate your old janky red camera anymore so we're able to upgrade to the next red camera and so it's been this thing that like we've grown a little bit of gear every year and so now we have a sprinter van full of gear that we have and so we're able to kind of take that on now our feature films too so you know we i go and i shoot and i edit and i direct these makeup spots and i you know bring them back edit them and that pays the bills but now we also have these tools that Mm. we've grown because clients requested them over time so now when we shoot a movie for like no money it can look more high end because we have these cameras sitting in the garage that are just sitting in the garage. And I feel like it's kind of put this extra pressure uh, behind me to be like, how do we use these tools while they're still good Mm. to like crank out movies and kind of create a machine here that we're able to copy and paste that formula in a way of of creating high-end production with very little money. So that's kind of my, I don't like renting gear. I like hate going to rental houses and renting gear. I hate dealing with insurance. I hate all that stuff. So it's been more, it's been a bit of my hatred towards not rent, you know, rental houses, um, <laughs> kind of being like, what are the tools we need to be mm-hmm. able to shoot regularly without having to go pick stuff up? Yeah. And, and then when so, you're ready to go, you just go, you don't have yeah. to like be like, Oh, I have to get this. I have to go here. And it's like, no, you, yep. you got everything you need. It's all together and you can go do yep. it. And yeah, I have to get these lights anyway. back by this time after yep. I shot all right. night. It's like, no, no like, no. Anyway, so, and it, yeah, so that's been kind of our experiences. Every year as a tax deduction for our business, we just mm. get the tools that we feel like we we need or want, and then we just use those for our movies and then rent them out for when we, we do our shoots. So that's kind of been our formula over the last 10 years, seven years, something like that. So, yeah. That's awesome. What's that process like when you're working with the client? Do they come to you, hey, we have this idea, and then you have to like write a script for it or write a, a, yeah. a prompt? How does that work? Usually they bring a lot of their own concepts. So they'll have a creative deck, and we just kind of fall in line with that. I feel like the biggest thing that I've tried to express to, to other people trying to make it in the business is like, don't be a jerk. Mm. Is just be flexible with what they need. Like, I feel like I have made a living being uh, someone's desperation call, where you know we hired this agency and they didn't do a good job. Can you can you cut this video and have it to us? You know, on Monday. And it's like, sure. You know, it's like just being willing to be flexible and work mm. with people. Uh, and you want to be that number, that phone number on their phone that they know is uh, is consistent and is reliable and can get stuff done. Um, and you're not going to charge them like crazy necessarily, but it's like, I'm all about how do you create that, um, returning client too, is like, I feel like a lot of people I talk to want to be like, I deserve 5,000 a day, you know, with just me standing there by myself. And I'm like, bro, like that's not, and you know, I may not get another shot with this client. So I need to make the most money now. And I'm kind of like, but what's that budget that you would be happy with that you could get returning client, you know, mm-hmm. like a returning, uh, business with. And I feel like that's kind of the way we've gone about it is like. By having our own truck and our own gear, 
uh, and then kind of having our own crew that we work with regularly and their rates, I'm able to have a number that I can then bring to them and be like, hey, this is for this type of shoot, you can trust that this is gonna be the number, this is all we have in the van, and, and you don't need to worry about anything else. So that's kind of been the way I've kind of created my business and, and working with people is, I'm that easy, quick, reliable call. And dude, what's crazy now is producers then wanna bring you on because they don't wanna have to deal with the rental houses either. Right. They don't wanna deal with hiring a PA to go pick up a van, to go pick up the gear, to bring it here. And so I feel like I've found that lately where people are like, even if your rate is a little bit more, they're willing to go with that as opposed to having to go with a rental house where they have to, and it may even even out where it's like they would have to hire an extra person and do all this stuff. So that's kind of been my formula is like, don't be a jerk. Be willing to be flexible, and if some some shoots, I'm just the DP, and I'll fall into that, and I'll shut my mouth and do whatever the creative per director wants me to do. And other ones, I'm taking more of a lead role, and I'm directing and shooting, you know, all at the same time. Um, and the rates change depending on that, but then sometimes they don't. You know, sometimes it's like I'll throw you a solid for this one, guys. You know, but just know down the line. But I really try. I basically now have a, three or four agencies I work with regularly hmm. that they know what my kit is, they know what I have, they know the product that we can deliver, and so we're we're on their little Rolodex contacts list. You know, when when they need us, we're there. So that that's been my my relationship. So. Yeah, the biggest thing I tell people is like, just don't be a jerk. Like, don't be a jerk and be flexible. And dude, I don't know. If, sorry, you're gonna make no, no, go ahead. It's <laughs> like I, I even work with certain DPS and people that like, you know, the client will come up and they'll be like, hey, is there any way we can make a look more of this? No, no, we mm. can't. Well, can we do this? No. And it's like there's no trying to help find a solution. I don't know if it's ego or what it is, but it's like, even if you're faking finding a solution, it's like turn that light up and down. Like. Yeah. Help help them feel like you're trying to solve it and do your best to do that. But I think you see these people in the industry that just get like irritated with like clients that aren't as knowledgeable with things. Mm. And it's like, it's not their job to know how the lights work or what this does. It's their job to be able to express what they need. And it's your job to try to help figure out how to get their vision across. Mm. And I think some, some filmmakers struggle with that because they have their so like, this is my vision for this 15 second makeup spot. You know, it's like, yeah. Do what they guys give them the product that they need here. Come on. Yeah. Don't be a jerk. Yeah. Yeah. That's my thing. It's just like be flexible, be willing to work with people. And usually I feel like if you're good and you grow at your craft and you're not a jerk, I feel like the work kind of finds you. So, hmm. cause then it spreads. That's how it's worked with us is like, like I said, we worked with one and then they all kind of went to their own different places. And then we get calls because it's the same thing. This agency sucked at what they did over here. Can you come fix it? You yeah. know? So what are some of the films that inspired you? This is tricky. Yeah. Yeah, I, no, do, 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 okay. I've been doing this little task for myself. Okay, this mm. is over like the last year. Is top ten films of like my, of all time. I've been doing a list, and I've gotten it down to top five. Okay, that's impressive. And my thing is like, because because I go based on rewatchability. I'm like, what's the, what are the ones that if I was strapped on a desert island or stuck on a desert island, and I had a VHS TV and I had VHSs, what are the ones I'd want to watch over and over again? Uh, and let me see if I can. You want to hear my list? Yeah, okay. yeah, for sure. Jaws is number one. It's mm -hmm. always number one. I love Jaws because it's two movies in one. You have the beginning that's like the shark attacking the town, and then you have the guys on the boat. So it like shifts, and mm. it's so anyway, so good. I just saw it in. They released it in IMAX this yeah, last year. Uh -huh. Dude, so good. <laughs> it's so good. Number two is Mad Max Fury Road. I love Mad Max Fury Road like uh, so much. It's such a basic story. Uh, it's literally like we drive here and we drive back. But the character development within that film is just so phenomenal. I love it. And Indiana, it's shot brilliantly. It's shot, oh, so good. Beautiful, yeah. And every time I think, I'll, I, when I go to watch it, I'm like, I'm going to figure out how they did it. Because, like, yeah. you know, you're like, I, I went to film school. I got it. Yeah. And you just watch it. You're like, I have no idea how they did it. I have <laughs> no idea how they did it. I even listened to, they have an audio book or a, a book about the making. I listened, to, I listened to it on my drives to LA and back. And I'm just like, this is insanity. I have, I still have no idea how you accomplished it. So, okay. Mad Max Fury Road. Then uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm. It's just, I feel like that's the one that inspired me originally to make movies. It's just a great like near perfect movie in every way. Oh gosh, it was number four. I think it was Empire Strikes Back, Star Wars. You mm, have to do Star okay. Wars. Star Wars is good. And then, oh golly, I had a fifth and I can't remember. I know Slumdog Millionaire was in there. I know it's kind of a curveball, but I like. Hmm. I feel like for me, it's what I've, I've I've learned about myself is I like these stories that are kind of simple. Like Slumdog Millionaire's boy loves girl, you know, gets girl, but the characters within that are so deep, and there's so much texture to that world. It's like simple story, but complex characters is kind of what really like Jaws, Shark hmm. Attacks Town, guys go kill shark. Couldn't be any more basic, right? You know, what I mean, Mad Max Fury Road, guy guy drives across desert, drives back. You know, it's like, but you're building it. It's like, how do you take this simple 
concept or idea and really dig into the depth of these characters. Um, and so that, I think, for me, is what inspires So When you're talking about what films I want to make, I, I like character pieces. Mm. I like to focus on a handful of characters and really dig into them emotionally as opposed to let's do a big action sequence and we're driving in cars or things are blowing up. It's like I'd rather, like, sit with someone in a bedroom and have them monologue and break down about something mm. than, like, film that stuff. And not that that stuff isn't fun if it informs – what's right. coming but that's why even our boxing movie i'm like i see it more as a drama with boxing than a boxing movie because i don't really have an interest in making a boxing movie i have an interest in what are these characters going through that are in the situation yeah so and then all that other stuff works as like a metaphor to like mm. what's going on internally with the person's character well, and yeah. how many times do we see too nowadays where it's like action movies that don't have great characters and they have these amazing action set pieces but they feel so bland and empty because you don't care about anybody. Yeah. You know, and it's just, it's... And there's almost, there's, there's no stakes either. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like you don't really care if the character lives or dies because right. you don't really know them as a person. Right. He's just in a big CG mess, you know, exploding all around him. You're just like, man, yeah, you want to keep watching this? I don't know. And that's where it's hard is it's like, I feel like we don't, mm. we don't dig into characters as much anymore. And, and I think we've lost, I don't know, I think we've lost some of that. So it's like, how do we get some of that back in, I would say. Yeah. So. Do you think it's, we've, gotten too commercialized and, yeah, I yeah. Think, yeah I want it because but what's hard is like you think about we're franchise heavy right you know right. where it's like everything needs to be franchise but then you look at something like alien and aliens mm. you know what I mean and it's like that's a franchise that's James Cameron and I feel like aliens has a lot all those characters and aliens uh, know who they are like you know mm. their backstory you know that they feel real rounded you see these relationships in little subtle ways and when they get killed you feel something and that's a franchise but I don't know why We've struggled, I feel like, almost take that formula to this new franchise-heavy world. I don't get why that... I don't know. I don't know why there's a struggle with that. A big thing is I think we're getting away from the hero's journey, too. And I, I'm mm. not even, like, the biggest supporter of that by any means. Like, everything needs to be copy and paste that. But that basic idea of growth, how we were talking, like, your character has this obstacle, and then they're met with this, and then they have to do this. I feel like we're trying to be so subversive against the hero's journey that now everything feels flat because there's no growth, there's no change, there's no transformation. And I, I don't know, I, 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 like, I struggle to like walk away from a movie feeling inspired as much anymore. Whereas like mm. when you watch an Indiana Jones or even like we're talking about Brian Ulrich in The Dark Knight, it's yeah. like you walk away like, yes! You know, it's <laughs> like I don't feel that for as many movies lately. And it's like a real bummer. Like, and I don't mean to rag anything, but like the new Batman movie that came out with, mm. with uh, Robert Pattinson, amazing film. Beautiful, incredible, yeah. I think. And story was pretty solid, too. But I didn't walk away feeling like, I feel hope, like in the dark night. It was just kind of like, okay, so now he's helping people. That's good. It was like last 10 minutes, he's like Batman, you know? Yeah. And that's fine. Like, I love that they're, they're telling different stories in that universe. That's fine. It's a beautiful, great film. But the other day, I had the choice. Do I put in the dark night or do I put in the Batman? Mm. And I put in the dark night, you know, over mm. the Batman because – and anyways, yep. I feel like that's a big part of it is these characters growing and changing. Where do you see yourself in the next five oh to 10 years? Boy. I know it's a tough oh question. Boy. It's a tough question. But like, if you could, I, I guess maybe like, what, what are your goals? Like, what are you, yeah. where, where are you, what are you aiming for? What are you, what are you trying to accomplish? Yeah. So with our like commercial side, we've been kind of growing up certain people from Biola are trying mm -hmm. to kind of get a little team in there to kind of grow up this commercial side where we have a lot of these clients. And so my goal would be is, is that the features take off at some point in a certain degree, however that looks, whether it's getting, it's, us getting money to kind of create more films or us getting brought into other projects in some capacity. Um, I would like for that to take off and us be able to transition out of the commercial space into that and then grow up some people in the commercial space to kind of take over that side mm -hmm. of what we do. That's kind of my goal in the next five years. Uh, and I feel like until we do that, it's just going to keep cranking on these indie films and telling stories that we want to tell. So it's one of these things like one of our films that we're releasing hopefully early next year, it's called Pastor's Kid. How do I put this in the nicest way? The majority of Christian films are, I would argue, are cheesy. Okay, I think they're very cheesy. And this is something too is, and this is for better or for worse. When I make movies, I don't follow a genre, so they're they're all over the place, bro. And I don't know. It's like when I was working in horror, I could have just done horror over and over again. I'd be the horror guy. Yeah. But that didn't happen, and so now I'm just kind of like, whatever I feel like I want to make in this genre, I'm going to make. And whether that's good or bad, well, I'll let you know in five years. But. Um, but, you know, for us, we kind of bounced around these different genres and what stories we want to tell in that. And so for Pastor's Kid, it's us making our first faith film. And for me, it's this idea that, like, that so many Christian films feel very cheesy. They feel very flat. The characters are one-dimensional. And I think for me, there's this aspect of faith that is so deep. Belief is so complex. 
and uh, and everyone has certain struggles they go through. I feel like when it comes to like, if you could just this is a blanket statement. Everyone has struggled with Christianity in one way or another. Mm. They've had a bad run in with a Christian or a church, someone representing Jesus in some way, right? Um, and there are certain people that choose to deconstruct fully and walk away from that experience. And there are certain people that deconstruct, I would argue, the Christian culture and then find their own spiritual belief. Like, I think there's some stat about like 70% of youth group kids walk away from the faith when they go to college, it's like 60 or 70. Mm. But then we see this thing in their 20s where they start to like, like mid to late 20s, they start to have families or get married and they start to kind of find their own spirituality again. That's not always Christianity, but new age beliefs or however you want to look at, you know, just finding that it's like, I can open up to the spiritual idea again. And so for me, like as a filmmaker, I really wanted to explore that aspect. And I, I had this friend that had this testimony that I got to kind of hear her story and shared where her mom was an alcoholic growing up. And so she had to basically raise her little brother and like wake up her drunk mom to go to work. They were very affluent. Her mom had a great job. So they had a nice house. It wasn't like dingy apartments. It's like they're in this beautiful house, like big expensive cars. And her mom's passed out drunk in the morning. So she mm -hmm. had to wake up her mom to get her to work. She's taking care of her little brother. Mom then becomes a Christian and, you know, uh, go, gets clean and all this stuff. And then she becomes a pastor. And so this girl then is like, everyone's praising my mom as this amazing conversion story mm -hmm. that like, oh, she was this drunk and now she's this amazing pastor and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, no one cares that as I was growing up, I had to raise my little brother. I had to take care of mm -hmm. her and all this stuff. So this kind of resentment started to build, this hypocrisy started to build. She's like, no one saw my pain and what I went through. And so uh, as she grew up, she said it even got harder because it's like, her mom would be like, you can't go out past seven. And she's like, are you kidding me? You were just drunk, mm. like passed out on the floor like two years ago. And here I can't go out past seven. And so uh, this kind of created a rift between them. She went off to college, uh, was a very uh, straight A student, did great, but she sold cocaine to her friends to make money and pay the bills. It's just these things that you're just like, I'm like filming this testimony. I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? Like, this is your story? And she said, yeah, you know, one day, you know, my Coke dealer who had no nose because it had sunk it in because he'd done so much cocaine. That was wow. like her story, a little detail she shared. She knocks on the door and he, she opens the door and, you know, her Coke dealer's there. And he tosses in a duffel bag and he says, the FBI are after me and my family. Don't contact me again. And he runs off. He just sprints away. And she unzips zips this duffel bag and it's full of cocaine and money. Just like rolled up dollar bills and just bags of cocaine. And she just like tells it like, oh, it's just a normal Tuesday. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, this is like an amazing, this is like our second act, like kickoff here for like your journey. And so basically she, she let us have the rights to her story, which I'm very thankful for. And we had to fictionalize some of it, obviously, and kind of condense characters. But we made this movie that's basically about her life and her story. And it's R-rated and it deals with all of the hardness. And my thing is... I wanted it to be about deconstruction. I wanted it to be the cynic's voice. Mm. You know, in a in a traditional Christian film, the heathen person will like accept Christ in the first 15 minutes and their life will change and they're perfect. And the rest of the movie is about them being perfect. Our character doesn't have like a good encounter with God until the last two minutes of the movie, three minutes of the movie. Mm. Because for me, the whole movie is her dealing and wrestling with one, the pain from her mom and her childhood, and then the reflection that now she's kind of becoming that in college. We're seeing her party. We're seeing her fill that void and seeing a reflection of herself as her mom. So how, how do we create some reconciliation there? How do we create some redemption there? And then on the flip side, the church, you have the church, the I would say argue cultural Christianity mm -hmm. that she's been burnt by and hurt by. Is there redemption there? I don't know. And then on the flip side, a spirit, the spiritual layer of is God real? Do I have this relationship? Do I want to have this relationship? What does that look like? And what I think is beautiful is that her relationship with God is different than her mom's relationship with God. And that's okay. It's okay for her to explore that and find that. And so we very much made a, a we call it the R-rated Christian film that nobody wants or no, there's no audience for because mm -hmm. I was just, I felt such conviction that it's like, I'm a Christian and Christian movies over, for the majority are not very good. How do I express myself through this movie? And it's no one else's responsibility to tell the story but me. I feel the burden to do that. And so I'm very thankful because we brought on just some amazing talent that like our lead in the film carries the whole movie. And she just, anyways, I'll, I'll send you some stuff with her because she's just, she's phenomenal. And just, you see slowly throughout this like hour and a half movie, her heart breaking open 
to all these different aspects and there becomes aspects of reconciliation in all these different ways that I feel like not everyone would expect. And, and for me, it's more so how do we leave the film with questions than we do with full answers, but still give a direction for an answer. The, the one film I cited for uh, is Moonlight. I don't know if you've mm. seen Moonlight, but mm. I love how that movie is a film about, I always say it's about a black gay kid in Florida. I'm a Midwest white straight kid from Indiana. I could not relate to this kid on any, culturally I can't relate, geographically I can't relate, you know, I, I can't, orientation I can't relate, but they made this movie that I just connected with him so much through his discovery and what he was going through. And it doesn't provide a solid, perfect answer at the end. And when I saw that film, I was so inspired. And I go, why can't we do this with the faith genre? Why can't we do something similar? And I feel like though it's it's a gay film or, or you know dealing with him finding his sexuality, it never feels like propaganda. It never feels like it's trying to force this on people and saying you have to agree with all this stuff or you have to believe this way. It's This is simply one person's story of discovery and finding who they are. And I'm like, why can't we do that? Dude, when I feel – anyways, so – you know, it's there's just there's so many stories within the Christian faith that I've heard. Like we even have some in my family of like attempted suicides and things like that, where God mm -hmm. intervened in my family's life. Like I wouldn't be here if uh, the su a suicide would have happened, you know, uh, in my family, you know, heritage. And I'm like, why aren't we telling those stories? They're these epic stories. Yeah. So I think that's anyways, awesome, sorry. and it's real too. It's yeah. real. I think that's for me. That's like the main thing. If you can tell a story that feels real. And it's heartfelt, and it's about real people doing real things. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a great story. And it should yeah. be universal, too, mm -hmm. where it should connect with just how Moonlight, I couldn't be further from the character. I connected with him. Why can't our movies connect with everybody who are going through experience? I feel like especially you know, this younger generation, as we're deconstructing and wrestling with some of these things in, in, cult in culture in general, but it's, you, know, you add that religious layer, I think these are a lot of questions people are asking and wrestling with is, just because that church said that bad thing or, or acts like they own Jesus doesn't mean they get to own Jesus. And I can explore my faith and my spirituality apart from that church that burnt me. And that's mm -hmm. okay. That's a good thing to do. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Anyways, as we'll see though, man. I don't know. We're hoping <laughs> to get that one out. We have this very interesting re relationship where it may go into theaters next year. We're trying to do these like one night screening things. And it's been very tricky. Like when I talk about that sandbox of, of mm -hmm. companies, it's like, we f we're, we're trying to figure out where we fit in the sandbox and it's it's we made a movie that doesn't quite fit and so we'll see if that's success or if it struggles to find an audience so yeah but yeah well best of luck with that dude I, I thanks think, man yeah and and thank you again so much for coming on the show dude uh, i i've it's been great hearing your 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 story and yeah you got a lot of a lot of a lot of good stuff i don't know we'll see yeah we'll see we'll see what makes it in the final cut i don't know we'll see it'll be no, like dude. a five minute yeah, episode. Like, <laughs> we have to cut this one short yeah dude, no thanks for having me on and dude Absolutely. congratulations and, and support and positivity thank to you, you doing you so this and just making something happen because it's like it's not guaranteed and so just to like go and do something is huge so yeah. good job to you man i appreciate that i really appreciate that you have an instagram social media yeah or? so our, our company is called ironside films so uh i-r-o-n-s-i-d-e ironside okay. films and so you can find us on instagram we're actually right now forming our own distribution company called 1988 films that should be all attached up there but basically ironside is our production company and 1988 is our distribution company for our movies and so i don't know man we'll see I'll, I'll let you know in five years where we land. So we'll see, dude. <laughs> Sounds good. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. And thank you guys so much for watching this episode. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe, and we will see you guys next time. Yeah.